Do you know what a big old wilderness bug is? For some reason, the higher in latitude you go, the larger the insects, and there is reason for this as it helps them retain heat in colder climates. Sort of like why in the Caribbean there are a ton of small, colorful fish, whereas in the deep sea, there is the wretched abomination known as an anglerfish. It's just sitting down there right now, and it knows I'm aware of its presence, which truly, it's an evolutionary dead end that should have ended a few branches higher to not result in this thing. You thought the anglerfish slander was done, not on my watch. Okay, so where was I? Okay, so deep sea gigantism. So essentially, the colder the climate, the larger the animals tend to be as it makes their bodies more efficient at retaining heat. But there is a limit to how large insects can actually grow without actual genetic intervention. Being one of the first living creatures to move onto land, or essentially onto land, like they were, they were on land. They were one of the first. They're not the first to come onto land, but they were pretty much the precursors to a lot of what we see. And if you take into consideration like crabs or arthropods, which are insect adjacent, the body style has been there for a very long time. You can kind of just see how long they've existed. But the point is, being one of the first animals, their bodies are fairly simplistic. An open circulatory system, a conglomerations of fluids and tissues within their body, and a fairly inefficient way to saturate all of their tissues with oxygen. This has made their sizes mostly dependent on the amount of oxygen that's in the air around them. But what if you were to introduce an element to the equation that could change their bodies to the point that they became a threat beyond just a parasitic one, or at least the parasites that they release into our bodies? In the events of mosquitoes, because for some reason y'all enjoyed Piranha Conda, so here's another movie that absolutely scared the living hell out of me in the 90s as a youngling, the local population of mosquitoes are exposed to something that causes them to grow much larger than normal, and along with that, they're able to suck a person dry in moments. Sounds like a great time, right? I assure you, it is very unpleasant. As a group attempts to survive this onslaught, we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen and wouldn't their bodies completely just body themselves in the process? The answer is yes, but let's take a look at how exactly they were able to survive in today's episode over the movie Mosquitoes. We kick off our story, as always, with a ship flying through space, because it's the 90s and everything everywhere had to be related to aliens. Sort of like in that weird phase in the 2010s where everything had to be about zombies and then sparkly vampires, then werewolves have to be coming at some point or so oh, no wait, they, they didn't try to imprint on vampiric newborns, hmm. You nicknamed my daughter after the Loch Ness Monster?! See, we really needed just two brothers to come in and just wipe them all out. Stand down. Fuck you! Heading towards the most based planet of them all, Earth, it drops something like a total turd in the punch bowl before ejecto cedo cousin out of there. At this exact moment, someone was driving a truck down a dirt road. Seeing as this movie is in 240p, it's really hard to tell, but there are actually two people standing there watching the meteorite land in some water. Remember, it's a meteorite because it has the right stuff to make it to the ground. The next day, a mosquito, as we know it, comes out of the water as there appears to be an alien arm sort of like just hanging out of the pod door. As it lays there motionless, totally vibing with the earth, the mosquito spears it, drinking its coagulated blood, if it has blood. As, good lord, what is this vehicle? Is that a 1989 Dodge Shadow? Thank god, those are all headed to the crusher once everyone realized they were driving a 1989 Dodge Shadow. Anyhow, as they drive along, Ray hits something as it explodes all over the windshield. Calling his girlfriend, the apparent animal expert, exposition, she goes to check on whatever is in fact completely decimated by the car. Not thinking it's a bird, she says, well, it looks like a bug. Ray then checks the engine for literally no reason at this point, but I suppose there could be a reason. Maybe fixing the grill, which it didn't hit at all. Like, really, if you freeze, in fact, my editor, freeze frame it when they run into this thing. It's like literally on the front. There is absolutely no contact with the grill of this vehicle. It is pristine. It only hit the windshield. Meg then uses her God-given right bestowed upon mankind when we said, oh, sorry about your evolutionary arms race, animal kingdom. Looks like I just learned how to throw a rock. And then she pokes the giant bug with a stick. USA. Remarking how it looks familiar, Ray then pulls something out of the grill that had pierced the radiator. Nice going, Ray. So that piece of crap is now totally done as wife beater Jacket approaches Meg. Looking at the bug, it's pretty gross. Meg remarks how it has a proboscis, a magical proboscis actually, seeing as it never hit the grill in the first place, yet strangely it pierced the radiator. The radiator is magic too, you'll see in a second. Meg says maybe they should just take it with them so that they can bring it back to the lab. Ray says forget it, he's not taking that thing in his absolute shitbox unit. 1989 Dodge Shadow. So, using another stick, USA baby, they just kind of throw it to the side, problem solved. Over at a campground, everyone's jazzed to be camping. Look, this movie is not going to gaslight me into thinking attractive women are playing volleyball at a campsite. I've been to campsites. It's always either a drunk 50-year-old watching football somewhere, a drunk 34-year-old, which is my brother, 
watching football on his fifth wheel, or me, also equally inebriated, wandering around allegedly hiking, but actually just completely lost in the woods. So anyways, Creepy McCreepster watches the volleyballers as he's told he's working late that night. We then jump over to a mosquito feeding on blood. Okay then. Yes, that is in fact how mosquitoes work. The chief then catches it and smashes it, totally normal, measured response. Laughing at it, there's a lot of dead mosquitoes in there. Totally normal and well-adjusted person too. As FNG then heads inside the building, the chief then starts espousing some nonsense about mosquitoes get the fever. Totally normal and me blood fever to be exact. This man dropped too many shrooms in college, which is exactly how he got this job in the first place. Like, I'm not even joking, this, this is a little off topic, but have y'all ever noticed how park rangers were definitely the ones who had a lot of experiences with plants? Anyhow, he says that they need to be wiped out, and actually I tend to agree, mosquitoes cause a lot of pain for the human race, and the only good bug is a dead bug. So, totally shifting topics, there is actually a debate right now about literally eradicating mosquitoes on this planet, but it comes with an ethical question of, just because we can, does that mean we should? They've actually worked on, I believe it's a virus of sorts using CRISPR. It's been developed, and if I remember correctly, each subsequent generation, it essentially sterilizes around 50% of the eggs. So working as a, like a genophage of sorts, I know, topical, right? Only a decade past its prime. Tally is still the best girl to this day, however. This would result in lower and lower mosquito numbers until ultimately that would result in mosquitoes not being able to find one another, which means less reproduction, which eventually would lead to the extinction of mosquitoes. Now, it sounds like a pretty good idea, and I, for one, I kind of think it's absolutely worth the moral dilemma associated with eradicating an entire species. The fact is, diseases are passed along due to mosquitoes to humans at alarming rates. Things like parasites and viruses are quite common because of these little POSs. Concerning uh, ecological impact, it is hypothesized to be minimal, but that's where the issue arises. The reality is, any animal that exists within a food web will have an impact on the food web if they were to disappear. As a result, is it the right of Homo sapiens to have that large of an impact on other animals? Animals. And to that end, we all know that I am violently pro-human here. I say it's our rock, and we inadvertently make animals go extinct all the time. So maybe mosquitoes should have learned to be more intelligent. But now, that, like, concerning other animals going extinct, is that, like, right of us to do? Or is it really just the reality we face? Could removing mosquitoes from our world cause a crash out for, like, other insects and the animals that eat those insects? Like, would it put too much pressure on other food sources, resulting in a cascade of issues? It is, unfortunately, completely possible. Unintended consequences of eradicating a scourge could result in the extinction of other animals due to the fact that larger animals will have, in turn, to basically hunt and eat other insects solely that they usually wouldn't. So it's a difficult question, really. Eradicate mosquitoes, solve a lot of diseases in our species, but we aren't sure of the far-reaching implications. Do not eradicate mosquitoes, disease continues, and a lot of suffering of our species ensues, but the food web is maintained. It's a legitimate question. So what do you guys think the way forward is? Because we have the capability, allegedly, right now, but there's a reason that we just haven't done it yet. Of course, then there's always the question of, could the virus jump species? And let's just say if it came to our species, considering we already apparently have plummeting birth rates, like, I haven't really been keeping up with that, uh, humanity's gonna have a bad time. Anyways, back to the 90s movie that's supposed to be campy and not a moral and ethical dilemma for our species, FNG is then set out to lay down a fog perimeter as another FNG is on his way. Out in the woods, another man is just sort of vibing out there, hopefully not also on shrooms. And also, if you haven't noticed, vibing is my new favorite word. No idea why. And I also just realized I saw this movie when I was like six, so there's a lot of memories to this, I remember actually. So, he says he will find something to nobody and then just kind of keeps walking. Totally, man. Good luck out there. So FNG has got the fog machine pumping out to like the 10th degree, and he's ready to party in the terminated system. As he gives everyone lung cancer, I'm sure everyone is super happy about that. Hopefully it's Monsanto, everyone is definitely sterile now. So as he continues to work, another vehicle pulls up. Wow, Meal Team 6 has arrived. As the former Gravy Seal gets out of his car, he's followed by Snack Ops and then Pastriot close behind. These names doing it for you? Checking his map, because it's the 90s, it's partially ruined. So these guys are getting eaten in like three minutes. He remarks about it being an issue that apparently his sons mixed bloodlines, or maybe he mixed bloodlines to create his sons. Hey yo, what in the name of all that is keeping in the family is going on here? So, Ray was somehow able to drive a car with a busted radiator, like, pretty far. A magical busted radiator. This car is actually, <laughs> apparently, unkillable. The inn manager then says there's a phone booth nearby where he can call the mechanic, and they are in cabin 7. So, as Mixed Bloodline dude kind of goes to use the bathroom, you'd think he'd be more intelligent, given that he's a little less inbred. He finds an outhouse and then gets hit with something. Looking up, it's a giant mosquito that is above him. He runs off bare-assed as he screams. I didn't need to see any of that. 
So they lock and load Brides of Christ hearing him yell as he keeps running towards his family as they spot the mosquito going after him. Taking pot shots at the bug, they miss of course as they straight up hit their bro in the spine. Nice going. They missed every shot possible except for the spinal shot, but eventually they are able to put the mosquito down. Also, that one guy just committed murder. Nice. You just took out your brother's son. Meanwhile, out at the lake, two men are there fishing, but really working overtime on a miller shift. Oh, except I guess it's Budweiser. They're being attacked by a regular mosquito, as one of the men finally gets a bite. Pulling up nothing, we get some stinger music for some reason. So, now to correct an issue. In my Lake Placid episode, I said murky, probably because I was talking about murky water, and it just kind of like mixed it up, so retroactive interference and all that. So a musky comes up to take the line as a mosquito appears, attacking the men and then knocks one of the men down as the other man tries to help but falls overboard. Swimming away heroically as his friend gets totally got, another comes to attack him in the water as the other man is in stabbed through the eye. Ouchies. Then his brains get sucked out. As the other man swims away, he hears the guy in the boat screaming, with his brains getting sucked out, as then he heads for land. Yeah man, they hunt by carbon dioxide as well as utilizing receptors and vision to like pick up body heat, perspiration, and skin odor, which we as a species stink. You might want to just keep running. So as he leans against a tree, we can hear them all over as he starts running again, but I'm sorry. Pick up a stick or something and swing away, Meryl. What are you doing? So as he gets attacked, the proboscis then goes into his chest, taking him out. Over at the cabins, Ray is talking to a mechanic about the radiator, and apparently it'll take two weeks to get there, which is not ideal, but it's probably because, again, it's a 1989 Dodge Shadow. They stopped making parts for those about two days later when they realized what they created, and they just wanted it to go away. Just remember, you can always just put a bunch of JB Weld on it and hope to God it holds or explodes. Either way, I wouldn't stand near that thing once you do. That's the American way. So, he starts getting frisky with his girlfriend as they turn off the light in futility because there's a giant spotlight on them. That night, everyone is going ham at the campsite. Nothing quite like getting frisky at a campsite with a family of six, eight feet away in a tent with thin cloth that doesn't stop any noise. There's an alarming amount of man-ass in this movie, as I have probably already described, and heading out with a PBR, he says he's gonna go water the plants. As he does though, a mosquito approaches and then lands as the cameraman set up in a very, uh, poignant position. So the mosquito then enters the tent, and we all know what this is about. Eventually though, she realizes it's not her dude and then freaks out, as one would do, and then it just kind of stabs her in the butt cheek. Ah, that's kind of painful. So as Bro then runs back, he gets got by several mosquitoes. So now it's the next morning as Ray and his girlfriend head towards the car, which defies all logic, working, yet broken radiator. Spotting a man with a Jeep, he then asks him if he needs help taking the cover off the Jeep. Parks and Ray talk as Girl Scout over here comes out of her cabin. Parks agrees to give them a ride, and I actually used to, well, I used to have, the, my dad used to have this Jeep, but I basically stole this Jeep all the time. That is a classic 1978 CJ5. Now the CJ7s are my personal favorite, only because the CJ5s had a high center of gravity and a very narrow wheelbase. You could basically flip these things at like 15 miles per hour in a turn if you weren't careful. Forget off-roading. Like they were meant for off-roading. Uh, yeah, you go over anything basically smaller or bigger than a molehill, you're screwed. Ask me how I know. And the CJ7 came with a longer and wider wheelbase, meaning you can now go 20 miles per hour in a turn before flipping. That's progress, baby! So as they talk about how Parks used to be in the Air Force, something then falls on Ray's foot. Parks pulls over asking for it, and uh, it's picking up something close by. Park says something is out there, but he doesn't know what. It's also never really explained as to how he knew the meteorite came down in this area, or how he knew it was emitting radiation, or really anything. God, I miss the 90s. They finally ask what this thing does, as it monitors differing levels of alpha and gamma radiation. Gamma, of course, being the one that shreds your genetic coding, by the way. Alpha cannot make it past your skin, if I remember correctly. So Parkson sort of nopes out of there as Megan decides to get out of the Jeep as well. Walking down the road, she looks over a bridge as a boat comes floating by, as she sees the desiccated meat suit of the fisherman from earlier. Officially gonna need years of therapy to get over that one, as Ray immediately makes a joke about it. They, they just found a body. How insensitive, Ray. Pointing the thingamajig that Parks is holding, it starts going crazy. Getting a stick to grab the boat, again, God-given right, they pull it in. Ray says it was aliens that did this, and I mean, that's a bit of a leap, don't you think? I mean, yes, we know it's aliens, but how do you know it's aliens? What'd you do? Read the script like a nerd? Megan suggests taking the body with them? <laughs> no! So, Megan just likes collecting dead bodies, I'm pretty sure. Uh, she's officially lost her mind. That's a really dumb idea, Megan. So they cover it up with a tarp instead, and then head towards the campgrounds. Pulling in, it's pretty empty, just like everybody's body. 
Got him. Megan then starts asking where everyone is. They can smell what the fishermen smelled like as well, which I imagine is like partially cooked meat considering they're all radioactive. So they enter the chief ranger's office. There are signs of an obvious struggle over there, and then they find the chief completely sucked dry along with any person that was in there. The phones are down too. The mosquitoes have cut the lines. Parker suggests it wasn't human whatever did this. Ray suggests, hey, let's just leave like a normal, well-adjusted person. As Megan says, no, no, we need to stay. Think of all the bodies we could carry back with us. Like an abnormal, unadjusted person. She didn't say that. I made that last part up. So panning over the tent, well, everyone's gotten totally got. Our like totally perfect summer vacation, man, ruined. So as Parks walks amongst the bodies, he looks sick as uh, he asks what happened, I guess, to the bodies. I mean, isn't it obvious? Alien mosquitoes. Ray and Megan then head over to the cabins where they were also attacked as they hear something under the boat. They approach the boat and then Ray smacks it with a paddle. Megan then flips the boat as F and G has survived. Heading back over to the campsite, this is like a really long tracking scene. So as Parks looks at one in particular, or one person in particular who was taken out, he inspects it and then pokes it with a stick. My man. The rest of the group then approaches, as Megan calls it by its scientific name. Only the females suck blood if you didn't know. Perfect segue into me telling you about my ex wife Just kidding. That would be, uh, supremely douchey. So Ray says that they need to get out of there. Parks asks about a phone, but the power is also out, and the radio was destroyed during the attack. So they agree to drive into the city to get the police. Approaching the Jeep, FNG says, Oh, rip right through the top of that vehicle! Uh, there's also no doors or no windows or anything else, so they decide instead to take a camper. One guy already tried that, and it didn't appear to go too well for him. So before moving on, there is one thing that I want to address. These mosquitoes' sizes and some of the principles here absolutely violate almost everything we know about a flight of an animal, as well as the physical structures associated with how these creatures would even function in the first place. First and foremost, mosquitoes are able to fly as is because they are very light. At that size, their wings are able to function in a way that allows for them to move through the air very clearly. And you may be tempted to think, okay, bigger wings make flight possible, right? Well, no. Their extremely small size, normally of a mosquito, allows it to fly. Now that it's larger, the proportion of body mass to wing size, it cannot be linear. It needs to almost be exponential as like a type of deal. Take a look at bumblebees, for instance. There's an idea that they shouldn't be able to fly, but this is unequivocally false because they do fly. The idea actually dates back to the 1930s, but because of their size and like haphazard ways that their wings move, basically the focus was on the size of their wings more than anything. But a bee's body to wing ratio is smaller than what is seen in other insects. So it was kind of like, well, they're probably literally on the cusp. Well, if you look at a dragonfly, for instance, their wings are quite large in comparison. But with the mosquito turned toddler size, their wings would need to be much larger than what they are just to get that weight off the ground. I mean, if you take birds, for instance, they actually have hollow wings. Now you take an exoskeleton, which is very heavy for like an insect, and then give it like probably similar size wings to like, let's say an eagle, it's not going to be able to fly. So this actual wing size that they have, there is no shot these wings are providing enough thrust to get them off the ground based on how heavy they actually are. The second issue that they must overcome is the actual body size itself, which we'll explain how it is achieved in a moment, but first we must discuss what needs to happen for these things to survive. If we look at a normal mosquito, much like other insects, there is a critical flaw when it comes to oxygen saturation. Longtime viewers already know, but for all the new people, insects contain something known as an open circulatory system. This system will pump body fluids around the body through a system of contracting sheaths of muscle. Kind of similar to a heart, but not quite. The issue with this system is it's a bit unfocused, whereas in a closed circulatory system like we have, this uses vessels to direct blood flow to all areas of the body, saturating the toes just as well as the intercostal muscles in the chest. This process is highly efficient and allows for a larger body size as well. With open circulatory systems, if you took an animal of our size and tried to apply the same structures, parts of the body would literally suffocate within just a few minutes as it could not possibly saturate tissues with oxygen. As a result, any insect that has an open circulatory system must in fact be smaller, allowing for their bodies to properly saturate. Now, in the past, obviously with more oxygen in the atmosphere, this allowed for more oxygen perfusion and as a result, larger body sizes until ultimately insects would shrink due to the lower levels available now. So this limiting factor brings up a question. How was this possible that they grew to the size that they did? Clearly the alien blood is the catalyst to all of this, which we'll discuss in a moment, but you're probably also asking yourself, well, does this mean, you know, we could have six feet long centipedes again if the oxygen in the atmosphere increased? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank God we don't live in that time frame. But pulling Mr. Flannel out of the camper, are we sure he's not just passed out drunk? Ah, wait, no, his spine's destroyed. Never mind, he's gone. Moving on. So as they slowly get ready to go, I mean that in the slowest way 
way possible, they can hear a buzzing noise. The Mansquitoes have returned. They batten down the hatches as Parks has to search for the keys outside. F and G gets out to assist Parks as they find them and then start the camper. Peeling out at a commanding 2 miles per hour, they are able to make their escape in the paddy wagon. That night, as they continue their drive, because apparently this place is like the biggest state park in existence, and I guess they were in the middle of nowhere, Parks just kind of keeps going as they find remnants of Meal Team 6 from earlier. Stopping as they seem in distress, Parks then is told they have been attacked as Team Eater approaches from behind. They are taking the camper as they hold them at force multiplied point. FNG then goes ham, taking out the first guy as Ray kicks him. Parks gets into some good old fashioned hand to hand combat, which come on Chair Force, where's the training? He ends up overcoming Team Eater as mosquitoes have then caught up to them. Megan says, well we can't just leave them out here to the mosquitoes. Uh, yeah, you actually can, it's really easy to do. Like, they did almost try to take you out. Like, I'm all for helping people, but if they are actively trying to end you, nah. Deal with the man-sucking mosquitoes. Ooh, God, phrasing. So, taking off once more, the horrific CGI mosquitoes that were copy-pasted are on their tails as they land on the roof. Ray then punches Junior as mosquitoes start breaking in as it becomes a fight to keep them out while also fighting with each other. Megan almost falls out of the camper at this point, and someone should probably lock that door, as this lets in more mosquitoes. F and G then pulls Megan in as Parks almost shoots himself in the arm trying to get rid of another one. Meal Team 5 are back and then saved before being sucked dry. Finally, Team Eater gets his hands free as he saves his apparent family member. I have no idea what the relationship is there. Team Eater then takes Megan as a hostage almost immediately, what a douche, as Team Eater says they are going back to the woods as he has his reasons. These reasons will never be expanded upon and never explained. He also says he's going to take out Megan as Ray threatens him. Ray then attacks Team Eater but fails biblically as he kind of forgot he's actually supposed to aim his punch as Megan then just kind of takes it in her own hands and stabs Team Eater with a probosis and then kicks him in the crotch. For some reason, Parks now loses control of the camper, like he's been doing this the whole time, as the mosquitoes begin landing on it. FNG gets hit in the leg as, whew, that's a femoral artery hit. Enjoy your last 30 seconds. But much like the radiator, however, it's a magical femoral artery that does not cause him to bleed out once pierced. Continuing to drive, one finally pops the tires because the mosquitoes would totally know how to do that. Yes, very good. As Parks continues to lose control of the camper for like the last 20 minutes, and then finally flips the thing over. Who let this man drive? So after rolling forward for like three years, it finally comes to a stop with the toilet close behind. You see, this is actually a reference to how all the movies I used to watch as a youngling were absolute shit. Emerging from the wreckage, everyone is a little bit dazed. Parkson lays down some law as Team Eater pulls a probosis out of his side, and at this point, I'm not sure how deep that went, but that appears to have been enough to give you about 30 minutes to bleed out, but don't worry. He also has a magical small intestine that will allow him to not go into septic shock in about four minutes. Don't think too much about it, this was on the sci-fi channel in the 90s. So, Meg and Ray finally emerge along with FNG as they all stand there left for dead style as Team Eater approaches. Parks continues to lay down the law like an absolute chad as Team Eater says they're gonna go their own way. In the distance, the mosquitoes are gathering, so now it becomes a mad dash to hide. FNG covers them as they enter a water drainage pipe as the other guy they just kind of leave behind. I should probably learn his name. I guess it's Junior. So as he stands in the road, just, oh, well, where is everybody? Doing absolutely nothing, he gets almost immediately got. Nice shot to the xiphoid process. Even if you did survive, uh, medical issues for the rest of your life. So he gets sucked dry. Good lord, look at that. Not really sure why your eyes would pop, but, uh, alrighty then. You would think because it's an internal depressurization that the eyes would not explode outwards, but would deflate. Then again, what do I know? I'm just a humble biologist. Continuing to crawl through a pipe, FNG then fires a shot, and everyone is now officially deaf. Entering a more open area of the pipeline, F and G continues to lay down shells as they randomly pick a way to go, running into more mosquitoes. From here, it becomes about clogging up the pipes with bodies. Everyone is most definitely mega deaf from, like, they're, they're not hearing anything ever again. But I guess it beats getting sucked dry, or does it? Lighting a shirt on fire, they then keep them back as the mosquitoes are afraid of fire. And look at that, everyone wore a wife beater and a white shirt, except for Team Eater and FNG. I wonder who's going to survive. But as they do, however, they then start discussing what they are supposed to do as everyone starts screaming, what? Because nobody can hear anybody. So Ray then accuses Parks of being out there and being sus for literally no reason, and they suggest maybe the meteorite did something and made the mosquitoes giant. The next morning as they emerge, the mosquitoes got bored and left apparently, and approaching Junior, man this guy's seen better days hasn't he? So Parks goes and gets his instrument as they realize the mosquitoes are making the meat suits radioactive. Odd. He suggests it's connected to the meteor, and if they find the meteorite, they can find the origins of the bug. FNG then gets angry about being found as he's been voluntold to save the world 
evolved from giant mosquitoes. Yeah, bro, it just do be that way sometimes. Beginning their hike through the woods, someone is running a fog machine like you wouldn't believe. Looking out, they then spot a house in the distance that has a ton of radiation in the other direction. They decide to go over to the farmhouse to take a look. Team Eater then says he will go off with Parks and Megan as Ray says, nah, you're coming with me and F and G. I mean, surely you could have left one side of the group with man's answer to uh, the Xeno scum. Approaching the farmhouse looks more like a church to me, but then again, what do I know? Heading inside, Folgers obviously sponsored this movie. Cabinets are open for, or at least opening for literally no reason as they continue calling out to anybody that may be inside. F and G then gets told to check the basement as then he starts complaining about it as Team Eater reiterates the point. Ah, they're bonding. Finding a record player still running, obviously someone was there at some point. As FNG then heads downstairs, things randomly fall because of course they do. As is tradition though, FNG clears it and immediately leaves. And by clears it, it's kind of a generous term. Uh, something was down there, he didn't even look. Meanwhile, Parks and Megan have left the forest and entered an enchanted meadow before returning back to the farmhouse, seemingly finding nothing. They then decide to start boarding up the house in case the mosquitoes come back for another attack. They seem to mostly come at night. Mostly. Wouldn't it be more intelligent to just lock down one room super heavily, rather than like, the whole thing? Like, literally, lock down the interior of the house, or why not lock down the basement? So Parks continues to work on the thingamajig as Team Eater finds a chainsaw. FNG continues to complain about his leg wound. I mean, I'd probably do the same thing. As Parks gives up fixing the thing as everyone is loaded, yet they keep pointing the pellet dispensers at their own heads and every other person. Very good. Listen, we're not trying to Alec Baldwin anybody here. So Parks then starts talking about how he used to be real tough back in the day when he was in Detroit, but now he's breaking down. Don't worry, man. We all get soft with age. One in five, they say. Oh, man. Also, Parks starts talking about how he did like three tours in Nam, And I was like, wait, what? But I guess this movie was only like 20 years after that ended. So technically speaking, I'm old. And because I'm old, hopefully that same 20% never comes after me. So Ray then talks about how he was in Cub Scouts, which makes everyone laugh, as Megan says she can hear a buzzing noise of the mosquito horde. Anya, they're giant mosquitoes. So, uh, horrible impression aside, as the house is surrounded, these things are just all over the place. Jenkins, fire your weapon! It becomes a fight for survival again, and uh, this is why you should have just heavily fortified one room. Team Eater then grabs a chainsaw and starts cutting down the mosquitoes as Ray decides he's gonna take out every other mosquito except the one attacking FNG, and instead he just rips the wings off that one. It wouldn't need it anyways, these things are crawling everywhere. Team Eater continues cutting them apart with a chainsaw as more continue breaking in. Megan is just sort of absolutely holding her own with a hatchet, lighting these things on fire too, baller. As heading into the basement, they then find the mother load. Hundreds of mosquito eggs have been laid there, creating an endemic population if they were to survive, which is obviously not very ideal. Running upstairs, they inform the rest of the group of what they found. Team Eater is then perplexed as how did FNG not see them earlier? It's because he didn't check. The meteor must be around here somewhere, which I don't think it actually is, and they need to blow the house to destroy these things. So now that we have watched most of whatever is going on and gotten to the eggs specifically, we can talk about why exactly these things are as large as they are. First, you may be tempted to believe that this must be some sort of random mutation, but I believe it's more than just that. Upon sucking blood out of the alien, there is really more of an issue than just being exposed to gene-altering levels of radiation, and I think it's fairly clear as to why. Not only their growth, but the green fluid that comes out with a proboscis, the egg laying, like the type of eggs they're laying, and again, their growth would indicate that there is a closed circulatory system now as opposed to an open circulatory system. For mosquitoes, they will lay eggs after a blood meal that will in turn become larva in the water, forming a pupa, and then ultimately an adult. However, the eggs in the basement are very different from a normal mosquito egg. Instead, these appear almost reptilian like snakes, lizards, alligators, and crocodiles because of their leathery appearance. Along with this, the mosquito no longer needs to lay its eggs in water, but just a warm environment that may be moist, similar to what a reptile does as well. Looking at the alien that crash landed, does the skin remind you of anything? Exactly, reptile skin. And for this, we need to look at some context clues as to why it's down here in the first place. Personally, I think this was a jettison on purpose by the crew that was controlling the ship. After it comes in and yeets the dude out of the pod of the ship, it flies off, either indicating that autopilot just didn't want this guy there, or there's a crew that's like, yeah, good luck, bro. The question here is, why were they launched out? 
This creature was also in a drop pods of sorts, where you think it should have survived, but it was DOA on impact. I believe a part of the story we never got is that this particular alien was infected by something and then thrown out of the ship as a result onto the nearest planet. This infection, in my personal crackhead opinion, because that's what I do here, and we're just kind of getting this out of there, like getting this out of the way, this is not canonical, but it would have to likely be viral in nature. As a result of it being viral and with us not even really fully sure in real life where viruses come from, this would seem to indicate that there could be viruses in the cosmos, at least in the Mosquitoes universe. Anyhow, as this infection was transferred from alien to mosquito, it is important to understand that sometimes things can go a little awry with infections via viruses. It has been regularly seen in prokaryotes, horizontal gene transfer can take place. Essentially, genes from one prokaryote are picked up and placed in another, using a virus as a vector. Now, only recently did we find that this can actually happen in eukaryotic cells as well, basically in you. And that means if you come into contact with a virus from your friend, like you contract it, there is always a slight possibility that you might actually pick up a gene from your friend, or at least part of a gene, and now you guys are officially related. This has actually been the basis of an argument that essentially supports the idea that evolution to a degree is reliant on viruses implanting genes from others in us, and that random mutations are not the only determining factor. It is a highly interesting idea, but it ties in here as well. Horizontal gene transfer can alter the very function of a cell or body plan should the gene transfer be enough, and that includes body size, closed circulatory system, level of intelligence, basically a proboscis that appears to leak out radioactive green fluid. We can see evidence of all this that horizontal gene transfer is taking place. The leathery eggs, the larger scale, the dripping goo, all these genes would be provided specifically by the alien DNA, which must have given its influences to the mosquitoes in several different ways, once again, affecting their size. So here's what I believe happened. This alien was infected with some sort of virus that was contained for now within its meat suit. Upon the mosquitoes sucking its blood, it was immediately infected. There is no telling how many genes the virus had picked up along the way, but these were then transferred to the mosquito by direct contact or a direct infection which in turn caused it to grow in size and develop new traits. As it sucked blood, it would keep laying these new type of eggs, which would create more and more as with its own nature. These genes were then passed on and have become a part of its natural coating of this specific mosquito. So basically, these aliens that yeeted him onto a living planet, complete douchers. So the plan is set. Break the gas lines, let the mosquitoes in, and then run like hell to the roof. Megan says that they need to take the dumbwaiter up, as Team Eater says, well, who's gonna stay behind and light the matches? Getting the house ready to blow, someone had a shriek noise of the mosquitoes just on repeat. They just kept pressing spacebar. You can't hear it, but I can. Using the thingamajig to then light the matches, they now have a timer. Heading to the basement, they need to get the gas lines broken and destroy the eggs. Breaking the line, the room then starts filling with gas while Parks disconnects the lines upstairs. Placing his meteor finder, he then sets it for roughly three minutes, which... Why didn't you just send everybody up to begin with? And... I, I don't know, this whole... Th Whatever. Breaking the boards on the windows, they then get ready to run, sending everyone up one at a time. Why not wait to set the timer until, like, you're, like, the last person, right? Like, no shot they're gonna get everyone up there before the house blows up. Team Eater then holds the door as F and G is next. The elevator pulley then breaks as Team Eater revs up the chainsaw to go save F and G because he fell all the way to the basement. Getting into the basement, he goes to look for him as Parks is left alone in the kitchen with the mosquitoes getting in. As Team Eater enters the egg room, they start hatching. What? timing. Parks then goes back into the corner as he has less than a minute left. As they surround Parks, he beats on his chest, because that's the way I want to go out. As he realizes, though, he could just go into the fridge. Ray and Megan then get onto the roof and jump for it. Running away, Team Eater causes a spark by accident, which detonates the house by like two seconds early. So the next morning, as they lazily hold hands, that looks totally natural, she tries to hug him as he pulls back. <laughs> that also looks natural. They hear coughing inside the house as Parks has survived by hiding in the fridge. Pulling him out, this man cannot stop Stop coughing as Team White Shirts celebrate their triumphant victory over Team Black Shirts who, uh, yeah, they got blown up. Like, they're not even gonna look for them. Absolutely brutal. So then they walk off, and thus concludes Mosquito. But I want to hear what you guys think. Horizontal gene transfer, creating giant mosquitoes, or something else? Let me know down in the comments. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link, where last week we talked about the Lizard Man of Or Swamp. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientist, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B-Grade Horror Movies, being very poignant for this movie, Dakota 23, Jax, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, and Trash Panda in a Trench Coat. 
and to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.